What's gaming, poppers? So we already discussed Revtel, Weeping Rose, the Quorum, and the Tyler Estate. But there's a few things I haven't mentioned yet. Also, as it turns out, I was very wrong about one thing in my Revtel video. Weeping Rose is not the capital of Revtel. In fact, it's not even in Revtel at all. I got this confirmed in an email from Steve Jaros, the writer of Artifacts. So Weeping Rose, the Tyler Estate, and the Quorum, and all of that is not in Revtel with the Merchant Kings, and Lord Sunbreeze doesn't rule it. It's easy to fix though, if you have watched the video already. Just separate the Merchant Kings and Assassination stories from Weeping Rose and it's all good. Then apply the Weeping Rose parts here and pretend, like I said, it's not part of Revtel. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry for this, I hope I don't repeat such a huge mistake ever again. Now that that's cleared up, buckle up, because this is a bit complicated. So, Pugna is in call to arms because he is sick of the Tyler estate punishing evil wizards who break the Quorum's rules. Viper, who formerly was Pugna's pet, is seeking vengeance on not just Pugna, but all wizards. Jamoy, the Dark Troll chieftain, leaves the Rosely Forest to seek residence for his people in Weeping Rose. One of the trolls of his people, Troll Soothsayer, warns us that the Red Mist Horde is nothing compared to the evil that awaits. But what exactly is the evil? Lich is among other things, following Lion to Weeping Rose, where Lion seeks asylum from the court of Ristol and Tyler Estate who are hunting him. Lich also mentions that the Vools are desperate to win the fight they are losing. This is very important, because it might be the answer to my question, as well as the card The Oath. Quick theory. The Disciple of Nevermore seeks out desperation in battle, and brings Rix to the court of Ristol. Nevermore will help Rix if he takes The Oath. Now, what the oath is exactly, we can only guess is what makes the dead wolves rise again. I also played with the thought of this being what started the dead god's dirge song, making Undying in the Undead Army, and maybe also Quidge, 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 and the Fields of Endless Carnage. But we know from Cruella, who I will come back to, that the dirge has already existed for a while, so if they are connected, the Rosleaf Call to Arms battle between the three factions must have been a very, very long time ago, before the initial disease attack on the Remescue by Necrophos, even before his story in Artifact. Oh, also, remember I mentioned Nog from Drew Wolf's art in my Reptile video? Nog is someone Vanessa is talking to, concerned about the dead rising. But Nog looks like some sort of demon himself, very much like Doom from Dota 2, in fact. I don't think he is Doom, and neither do I think he is a demon. We have already seen designs inspired by this concept art be changed a lot in Artifact, so Nog could be anything. But Exiled Prince is very interesting. What it means, I can't tell you, but the Oath is something Vanessa is familiar with, perhaps because she has done something similar in the past? The Cursed Satyr is being chased by zombies that she and another female somehow awakened as children. I think, and headcanon warning, this is by no means necessarily true, but I believe that she did this with Vanessa. In Whispers of Madness, Vanessa reveals that she has toyed with necromancy. This is important to keep in mind when we get to more about Vanessa in just a second. Like we already looked at, the Troll Soothsayer warns of a coming evil, and Omni Knight too is sensing it. That is why Omni Knight enters the Call to Arms battle, because he seeks out Luna to join forces between Salamene and the Omniscients to fight the Court of Ristol and their undead shenanigans. Luna the Moon Rider leads the Dark Moon, a worshipping sect of Salamene, the goddess of magic and the moon. Salomene herself actually shows up in the battle. Luna didn't originally go to Rosalith to meet with Omni Knight, she just seeks to help Sorla not make the same mistake as she once did. This is a little interesting, because Sorla was meant to be assassinated by orders of King Quirthius, but that didn't happen, because the Veiled Sisterhood assassinated him before he could do that. Maybe Luna will be the answer to stopping Sorla now, in this new timeline? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so Vanessa, who is she? We saw her in Whispers of Madness, where she talks about Pierpont. Pierpont is a member of the Sapphire Conclave, who made the Klesurim Treaty. It's a deal between our realm and the Klesurim realm that we will not do chronomancy. The Faceless Void is the Lord and Shaper of Time, and you do not want to mess with him. We see from the spell buying time that Vanessa has performed chronomancy before, and the improvement glyph of confusion worries me. People want her dead, and in Whispers of Madness we know she has dabbled with things she doesn't understand, specifically involving her death permanent death. So maybe Vanessa was Pierpont's wizard apprentice, but fucked with time in a way that revived the dead? Maybe she used the Klesurame Hourglass? By the way, Mareska the Dark Willow is familiar with the item in Dota 2, where she seems to have stolen it. Another source for Vanessa toiling with death is Book of the Dead. They agreed on leaving it with the Winter Wyvern, but because Vanessa was in the discussion, maybe she used it to bypass the narrow maze? I wish I could give you more concrete information about Vanessa, but this is all we got unfortunately. 
I don't think she's part of the Sephir Conclave because it's pretty obvious she has done something bad. Vanessa also talks about Agnim and Rubik. She's confirming that an artifact he is still around. I mean he's gone, but at least not dead to our knowledge. And she thinks he's working on something big. Maybe the scepter? On the spell Arcane Assault, she also doubts Rubik's claim to be Agnim's son. Also, a quick side note, on Arcane Assault, Vanessa is described as an opinionated occultist, further proving she's a bad, bad girl. For being an occultist, I mean, not opinionated, lol. By the way, Rubik seems to be in the Tyler estate for some reason. If we look at Arcane Assault, Collateral Damage, and Arcane Censure, it seems like he maybe wanted to infiltrate the Quorum, and then ended up getting caught by Antimage and punished by Saliancer. The last character affiliated with the Sephir Archons is Crystal Maiden. She is the Warden of Ice Rack and collaborates with the Sephir Conclave on magical crimes. Remember, in Revtal, the Quorum makes the magic rules, but outside it's the Sephir Conclave. The Quorum are much more liberal in the rules, which is why, for example, maybe Lion is seeking asylum in Weeping Rose. Crystal Maiden references to her sister Lena in Conflagration, hinting that they will perhaps be on the same side of the battle. In the card Lena is in Roseleaf, evident by the nature and centaurs in the background. The biggest reason why I mention Crystal Maiden, though, is for a small headcanon about her and the Sephir Conclave. She is from Ice Rack, and if you have seen my Dota Geography video about the North, you know in Ice Rack there is a glacier running through it called the Blue Heart Glacier. It got this name because of the sapphires you find in it. Also, Crystal Maiden's master in the North that taught her ice magic is some old super powerful wizard who decided to hibernate in the glacier for a thousand years. So my awful theory is that the Sapphire Conclave might reside in Ice Rack in the Blue Heart Glacier or be originally founded there. Also, I have no proof, but I'm blindly guessing and I want to believe that Pierpont is in fact Crystal Maiden's master. I can't remember what I read, but something made me think this a long time ago while reading up on a lot of stuff. It's up to you if you also want to believe. <laughs> so the dead are rising, both from Rick's taking the oath and the cursed satyr maybe doing necromancy or chronomancy with Vanessa. But there's also another source of undead, and maybe we can find a correlation. The hero Necrophos doesn't mention anything about the Romescu in Artifact, but in Dota, we know that he was the scamming cardinal of the Romescu, taking advantage of a plague perhaps conjured by himself, slowly killing most of the Romescu while taking a lot of money for healing a last few survivors. As punishment, he was sent to the Plague Ward, where he was supposed to die a long, painful death to illness, but he turned out to be immune and instead made him the powerful Pope of Pestilence. He now travels the world in spreading his plague, and is in Roseleaf to spread it with the Red Mist Horde. The Cathedral of Romescu is where the worshippers of a deity very similar to our own Christian god reside. They have a lot in common with both Omni-Knight and Chen's god, and are perhaps the same. Omni-Knight is opposed to the demonic court of Ristol, who we suspect caused the dead rising with Rix, and Chen is in Roseleaf specifically to join forces with the Romescu. That they share the same god is only a theory, though. The Romescu opposed the dead god, and in Dota 2, we know that they purged the fields of endless carnage, where the corpses don't decompose. The Pangolier has described the purge as dark, so maybe the fields of endless carnage weren't evil at all? In Artifact, we have a few sources that also support this, that they were in fact peaceful people, even civilized. Coage is a city in the fields of endless carnage, where Tristan, the swell chap, is from. The Romescu is not convinced though, and their clerics detest the undead metropolis. The clerics and warrior priests as we know purged them, and were led by Lady Ashnu. Lady Ashnu is also not a fan of Necrophos, as Pudge hints to in Dota 2, where he tells Necro that maybe if he gave Lady Ashnu his head, she would stop harassing Pudge's undead friends. We can see Lady Ashnu in the card's Romescu Blessing and Cleansing Rite. Her disgust for the undead is even more apparent in the card Revenous Mass. Another cleric who fights the dead and hates Necrophos is Abajen the Selfish Cleric. We mentioned that Chen is seeking out the Romescu and specifically Lady Ashnu, and he wants to do it to convert them to the Holy Knights of the Fold. But he also mentions that Lady Ashnu might be the second coming of Krella. Who's Krella? Heh, I'm glad you asked. Krella was an extremely powerful priestess from the Cathedral of the Romescu a long time ago. She formed the Chains of Obsession from the Pudges Dota 2 Arcana cosmetic. The chains were meant to bind the servants of the dead god, but over time, they became corrupted by the dirge instead, and took a mind of their own, and destroyed her homeland. This was way before Necrophos' Dota 2 backstory, which again is before Artifact. The chains now belong to Pudge. Pudge was not in the fields of endless carnage when they got purged by the Romescu, by the way, which is why he is still around. Okay, so let's summarize a little bit. My personal theory about the oath is that Rix took it and he's causing the dead wolves to rise. I also think Vanessa and the Cursed Seder have been bad girls. 
I think either of these or both, along with the undead from Undying Lore and Fields of Endless Carnage, may or may not be connected. Next, I think Omni, Chen, Salomene, and the Remescu are joining forces to oppose the undead. The Klazraim Treaty is a peace agreement between the Klaz Realm with Faceless Void and the Sapphire Conclave. Vanessa is from Weeping Rose and may be in the Quorum, whereas Pierpont is in the Sapphire Conclave, the magic authority outside of Weeping Rose. The Romescu are fighting the undead, and have been for a very long time. Now that you have everything fresh in your mind, here's what order I think the events happen in. Bear in mind, as always, these time guesses are just that, mostly guessing, so it's by no means fact. Everything in Artifact starts off with the Priestesses of the Ancients from video 2, and then I think the things from my Revtel video, Call to Arms 3. We know Quirthius must have been killed before the Call to Arms battle between the three factions, years before in fact, because both the Prelude comic and Beastmaster's lore only make sense if this is the case. Then I think the Battle of Roseleaf happens, which is the main thing in this set. And then, I think the undead drama starts off right after Rix takes the oath and at the end of the Roseleaf battle, which ends the first set of artifacts and starts the second expansion. I think therefore, the second expansion will revolve around Rix and his undead army and the Ristol, their opposing side I don't know, maybe the Romescu and Mages of Weeping Rose? Meanwhile, the Weeping Rose stuff happens, such as the Emissary being sent out and Lion and all of that. Then I think what happens is Omni, Luna, Chen and the Remescu and maybe Troll Soothsayer get anxious about the undead and senses something wrong and come to aid versus evil. Luna is already in Roseleaf to help Sorla though, which is why Omni is seeking her there. And that concludes the Call to Arms lore. Don't be afraid though, I have one more video coming up with all the theories left untold, such as the Keen and the Sulk, the Thunder Gods, Drow and Abaddon, the Centaurs and the Beastmaster, etc. Everything that didn't naturally fit into these previous four videos. As always, thank you for watching, and thank you for all the support. That was all, you may leave now, have a wonderful day, peace.